Hello, my name is Allison Palmer. I'm an internal medicine resident. I'll be staying at Mayo Clinic next year to complete a geriatrics fellowship. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to talk to you today about the field of aging biology and the research that is ongoing in efforts to improve health with aging. During our time today, we'll spend the first few minutes talking about aging itself and answering the questions, why do we age and how do we age? We'll talk a little bit about how scientists go about studying aging. Then I will share with you what the evidence says about healthy aging and what strategies we can all take to pursue healthy aging. Finally, we will talk a little bit about the future directions of aging research, including studies that are moving into human patients. Now, everyone may think they know what aging means, but if I ask you to define the word aging, what would you say? It is such a universal process that we may not even think about what aging actually entails. One definition of aging could be in the context of time, a progression along chronology from conception to death. Another definition of aging would focus on the changes that occur over time, these being molecular, physiologic, and functional changes over the lifespan of an organism, as well as the body's response to those changes. When we try to characterize aging, we find that aging processes have several characteristics. Aging processes are universal, meaning that all individuals in a species exhibit aging changes if they live long enough. Aging processes are also intrinsic. These changes occur despite environmental cues. For example, if you placed an organism in an isolation chamber, aging would still occur. Aging processes are progressive over time, meaning that the process increases or compounds on itself in a time-dependent manner. They're also heterogeneous, affecting individuals different, differently and affecting different tissues even within the same individual differently. So why study aging? Well, as we just noted, aging is universal and happens to everyone. In addition, our society is being impacted by the process of aging. Does this photo bring anything to mind? How about this one? You may have heard mention of the so-called silver tsunami that is expect expected to affect our society in the next 10 to 20 years. This term is a metaphor for the large number of adults who will be reaching older age in the coming decades. This map is colored to represent the percentage of the population over age 65, with the light yellow color representing less than 7% and a deep purple color representing 28% or more. So the darker the color, the larger percentage of the population is over age 65. On the top part of the figure, um, in 2015, 8.5% of Americans or 43 million people were just were over the age of 65. In 2050, this number is expected to double, just 16% of the population or 89,000 Americans. We can attribute this unprecedented demographic shift to a variety of factors many of which benefit people of all ages. For example, even within the lifetime of some, some of today's older Americans, infectious diseases that once cut millions of lives short have been largely controlled in the US. And public health campaigns and policy changes, for example, smoking cessation efforts and laws mandating seatbelt use have saved many lives. But this comes with significant societal and economic impact as these extra 40, 40 million additional people are expected to rely on Medicare, use more healthcare, and even need senior living. A significant increase in the number of individuals with serious chronic conditions will have profound social and economic effects on the nation. Given this, it's in our society's best interest to invest in the study of aging in order to find ways to mitigate the effect of this population change as much as possible. So switching gears a little bit, scientists have been thinking about aging for as long as scientists have been able to think. As you can imagine, there are several hundreds of theories out there trying to explain why we even undergo the process of aging and how this occurs. So I'll discuss just a few of these here. The first theory that I want to share is based on an evolutionary concept regarding how mutations are passed from one generation to the next. Natural selection acts on genes which affect an organism prior to and during their re reproductive period. Genes affecting an organism after its reproductive period are not likely to be affected by natural selection, but are passed on. Therefore, mutations that are harmful in later life may become enriched if they are beneficial in early life. 
the mutation accumulation theory posits that aging is due to an accumulation of these mutations, which are possibly beneficial or at least neutral in early life in the reproductive period, but which are harmful later in life. Other theories, the programmed aging theories, assert that aging is an essential and innate part of the biology of humans, and that aging is programmed into our body systems. Otherwise, we would live forever. These theories posit that aging and death are programmed, natural, and necessary part of our genetics. In short, we are genetically programmed to age and die. This theory is supported by the fact that there is not a great deal of variation in lifespan within species that despite differences in environment and other individual factors, overall lifespan within species is fairly constant. Thirdly, the wear and tear theory of aging addresses the practical concern that organisms simply cannot have normal function indefinitely due to environmental and metabolic damage, as well as a limit to regenerative me mechanisms. Aging is therefore an accumulation of damage and an exhaustion of regenerative potential. No matter the reason for aging, it does occur, and along with it comes disease. As more people reach later and later ages, they tend to accumulate more diseases. This graph shows the relationship between age and accumulation of chronic disease. On the x-axis is increasing age, and on the y-axis is the percentage of patients. Each color represents a certain number of diseases with the darker colors representing a greater number of disease and the lighter colors representing zero, one, or two. So if we look at, take a look at the patients age 65 to 69 and draw a line at 50% of those patients, we see that 50% of people in this age group already have accumulated two diseases. And as we move along the x-axis with increasing age, people tend to have accumulated more disease. We tend to think of aging and age-related diseases as, a separate, as two separate entities. However, what if they are all part of the same process? Aging is a major, if not the most common risk factor for chronic diseases that affect organ systems throughout the body, including neurodegenerative and cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, and others. Aging biologists are interested in finding interventions that target common basic aging mechanisms that drive disease across organ systems. In this way, we hope to be able to delay age-related pathologies as a group rather than focusing on each disease individually. So if this is our goal, we'll need some tools in order to achieve it. So how do we study aging? Well, we have many strategies to investigate the questions we have about aging. We can use cell culture to study the cell biology of aging. We can use animal models to study whole organism aging. In other words, how different organ systems interact with each other during aging. And we can also use animal models to test experimental therapies. Aging researchers also utilize epidemiologic studies in which they're able to study aging in a population and try to find factors that are associated with aging within that group of people. We can also use clinical trials to test aging interventions in human patients. There are many special populations around the world in terms of aging, whether that is exceptional longevity or exceptional premature aging. In the realm of longevity, science have been able to learn from long-lived individuals, for example, centenarians, which are individuals who have lived 100 years or more. The longest lived individual that has been identified was Jean Clement, who lived in France and died at the age of 122 years old in 1997. Scientists are also able to learn from long-lived animal models, such as the naked mole rat depicted here. Although the naked mole rat is the same size as a typical laboratory mouse, the mouse lives on average only three years, whereas the naked mole rat lives on average 30 years. Scientists are looking into the mechanisms by which an animal of similar body size to another could live 10 times as long. We're also able to study long-lived populations. You may have heard about the blue zones, which are populations around the globe where people tend to live longer than other areas. Scientists are studying these populations in order to identify factors that, are, that underlie their longevity, such as diet, attitudes, and social interactions. On the other side of the longevity continuum, there are exceptional individuals who undergo premature aging, and we have learned much from these individuals as well. An example of, is that of Hutchinson-Guilford syndrome, 
a so-called progeroid syndrome due to a mutation in the lamin A gene, which encodes a protein that is needed to stabilize the nucleus of cells. Because this mutation disrupts cell division, individuals who have this mutation develop rapid aging of their tissues and by age 10, develop premature changes of the superficial tissue, such as the skin, hair loss, and even coronary artery disease. The median age of death of these individuals is 13. And unfortunately, few survive beyond 30 years old. Scientists can model premature aging with mutated mice that also have defects in cell replication or DNA repair, causing premature aging. The photo that I'm showing um, is depicting two pairs of mice, which on the left in panel A and C look about the same in early age. However, as the mice age in panels B and D, the top and bottom mouse are of the same age. However, the mouse on the bottom, which has a defect in its DNA repair, has age-related changes in his skin and hair, as well as muscle loss that are not seen in the normal mouse. Interestingly, individuals living with HIV have also been noted to undergo premature aging. This is thankfully now being mitigated by antiretroviral therapy. Another population that experiences premature aging is individuals who receive treatment for cancer as children. These cancer survivors have been noted to develop premature onset of age-related diseases as well. So are aging researchers attempting to find the fountain of youth? No, not at all. They're quite aware that the goal of immortality is not only impractical, but would also be unhelpful to our society, as this would only cause individuals to live longer with disease and debility. Instead, aging research is focused on a concept called health span. Health span is the period of life when individuals are independent, free of disability, and free of pain. In this diagram, lifespan is depicted along the X axis, and health span is depicted in the light gray area. As function declines over the lifespan and basic aging mechanisms start to kick in, we eventually pass a threshold at which age related chronic disease develops. Here, this is developed by the darker gray area. An individual remains functional and continues to participate in society during this period. However, with increasing age, an individual may develop frailty or increased vulnerability to stressors that results from age-associated decline in reserve and function across multiple physiologic systems. This is depicted by the black area. Since fundamental aging mechanisms drive these changes over the lifespan, our hope is that by, interve by intervening prior to chronic disease onset, by targeting basic aging mechanisms, that we may be able to expand or extend the length of health span so that the healthy and independent period um, can extend later into the individual's lifespan. This would in turn hopefully shorten the time that we live with chronic disease or frailty. And this concept is called compression of morbidity. As previously discussed, keeping people healthy for longer is expected to have significant societal and economic impact. Not only would individuals be able to participate in society longer if their health span is extended, but the economic value of delayed aging is estimated to be $7.1 trillion over 50 years. So investment in research to delay aging appears to be a very, very highly efficient way to forestall disease, extend healthy life, and improve public health. Individuals living healthily for longer can also contribute to society for longer, as I mentioned. So since we've been discussing the utility of targeting aging mechanisms to extend health span, we'll spend a few minutes defining what those aging mechanisms are. The aging research community has defined several so-called hallmarks of aging, and we'll discuss four of those here. The first is chronic sterile inflammation. Inflammation is detected in many tissues with increasing age, and is characterized by infiltration of immune cells as well as increased pro-inflammatory cytokines. But in the, absence of, in the absence of any detectable infectious agent, such as a virus or bacteria, this inflammation is damaging to surrounding tissue and has been linked to many diseases, including diabetes. Another important mechanism of aging is dysfunction of molecules within the cell, like RNA, DNA, and protein. Each cell in your body, except your red blood cells, contains a string of 3 billion DNA letters, 
that defines your individual genome. And proper functioning of your genome is largely responsible for the smooth running of your body. However, your genome is under constant attack from both external sources like radiation or pollution and internal sources such as oxygen-free radicals. Usually our body can repair DNA damage efficiently and without errors. However, this mechanism begins to fail with age. As I showed you earlier, mice and individuals with compromised DNA repair mechanisms do show signs of accelerated aging. DNA is transcribed to RNA, which is translated into proteins. And these proteins conduct most of the function of the cells in our bodies. Therefore, changes in protein function are also important um, as an aging mechanism. Our bodies have mechanisms to recycle old and dysfunctional proteins, but again, these processes become less efficient with age. Proteins also have to be carefully folded in, or in order to do their jobs, and if they do not fold properly, can clump together and become toxic. Alzheimer's disease is an example of an age-related disease caused by protein misfolding. Problems with protein folding and recycling can lead to tissue dysfunction and development of disease. The third mechanism is stem cell dysfunction. The ability of our tissues and organs to regenerate and repair damage is critical to maintaining health. Our body's ability to reg regenerate tissues and organs depends on healthy stem cells, the ultimate source of all new cells in virtually every tissue. Healthy stem cells must replicate when required, but otherwise, um, but otherwise should not be replicating. So the replication ability of, of stem cells and their ability to only replicate when needed declines with age. This is due to a depletion of stem cell pools, an inability to differentiate, or errors in differentiation to make the wrong types of cells. Last but not least, we will discuss cellular senescence, which occurs when cells that once replicated vigorously have entered into a permanent non-dividing state. These senescent cells are no longer functioning as they did, but they also do not die. They persist in the body and can secrete inflammatory materials that can damage molecules and cells around them. Cellular senescence can be caused by many stressors, including damage to DNA or metabolic signals. So this is a diagram showing that senescent cells form in response to damage and other signals and, pers and persist in tissue. They're shown here as the blue cells. These senescent cells then begin to secrete pro-inflammatory molecules called the senescence-associated secretory phenotype, which we nickname the SASP. And they start to recruit other cells, including immune cells. This can set off a cycle of persistent damage to the tissue associated with inflammation and fibrosis. Sometimes the immune system is able to clear the senescent cells to allow for regeneration of the tissue. However, not all senescent cells are typically cleared. So with aging, we see accumulation of senescent cells over time. And this has been associated with the development of disease all over the body as shown in this figure. Diseases as diverse as type two diabetes and COPD, as well as macular degeneration and Alzheimer's disease have all been linked to senescent cell accumulation. <clears throat> so with all of this in mind, knowing that, that scientists have been able to study aging for quite a long time and can study cells, tissues, model organisms, and even populations of people, what do we currently know are the best strategies to ensure healthy aging? Well, to begin with, scientists have examined the entire genome looking for specific genes that may, may confer a long life, a smoking gun, if you will. For example, they've sequenced the genomes of individuals who've lived over 100 years, the centenarians, versus people with normal longevity. These studies have unfortunately not resulted, oops, I pressed the wrong button, I'm gonna have to go back in my slides here. Just hold on a second, sorry about that. Here we go. Okay, so unfortunately, these studies have not resulted in the identification of any one gene or group of genes responsible for longevity. It's much more complicated than that. However, we do know that longevity does have a hereditary component um, because we know that um, in previous studies, offspring of centenarians have a longer expected lifespan than other people of the same age. So there must be some component, but it's not one particular gene or a group of genes. There are several ongoing epidemiology studies that are tracking populations of people over their lifespans and collecting data on lifestyle, genetics, diet, activity, body composition, and other factors. 
Um, one of these studies, the Rochester Epidemiology Project is actually happening right here in Olmsted County and has provided data for innumerable studies. Another is the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging, which is ongoing on the East Coast. I would encourage you to go to the website of either of these studies. They publish a wealth of an in interesting information about their findings. Taking into account all of that epidemiologic data, what is the biggest factor that we've found um, to, pro to promote healthy aging? And as you can tell by this figure, it's exercise, of course. We have not found any intervention that is as effective as exercise in promoting healthy long life. Exercise is associated with longer lifespan and longer health span, prevention or delay of dementia, reduced risk of falls, especially with balance activities like Tai Chi, reduced risk of osteoporosis, especially with strength activities, and improvements in high blood pressure, diabetes, and heart disease. There are other, several other factors which have been shown in studies to be associated with healthy aging. The next is social connection. Loneliness is very harmful to your health. If you feel lonely, whether you're living alone or with someone else, have lots of friends or not really many friends, you're more likely to get dementia or depression. And people who report feeling left out or isolated have more trouble with everyday tasks like bathing or climbing stairs and can even die earlier than less lonely folks do. Researchers found that lonely people have higher levels of stress hormones that cause inflammation or swelling, um, and that this is also linked to arthritis and diabetes. Um, other studies have found that there are more antibodies to certain viruses in lonely people, kind of a sign that stress in their of that stress in their immune system. So reach out to your friends, your family, and make new friends. Um, do volunteer work or simply just help someone in need. Just connect with others. It's, it's very important. Diet, of course, is another major factor in healthy aging. When scientists study the populations who reside in the blue zones or areas of the world where people tend to live long, diet is typically a unifying factor. The diet which has the most evidence for promoting health is actually the Mediterranean diet, which focuses on healthy fats and proteins, as well as lots of vegetables, nuts, and whole foods. A factor which works directly against healthy aging is tobacco use. Smoking cessation is critical to a healthy long life, as tobacco harms almost every organ in your body. Cigarettes, chewing tobacco, and other products with nicotine cause heart disease, cancer, lung, and gum disease, and many other health problems. And it's never too late to quit. Your body begins to heal within 20 minutes of your last cigarette, and your chance of a heart attack goes, goes down right away. In a year, your odds of heart disease actually drop by half. And this is also associated with a longer life. Finally, sleep is very beneficial for healthy aging. Sleep is the body's time to rest and repair. In fact, recent research has um, discovered that the brain actually clears misfolded proteins, such as the ones that lead to Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease during sleep. Therefore, it's very important to allow your body this time to restore itself. If you have trouble with sleep, ask your doctor for help. Some strategies to try are to avoid screens, such as the TV, a cell phone, or laptop for the hour before you go to bed avoiding caffeine in the afternoon and avoiding alcohol in the evening, as well as limiting naps throughout the day. So in the last few minutes of my talk, I want to tell you about a few current areas of study within the aging research community that may soon impact patients or at least enroll patients in clinical trials. Aging research has long been a very basic science with few interventions proposed to actually target aging mechanisms. This has changed dramatically over the past several decades, and we now know of over 20 compounds or drugs that can extend lifespan and health span in experimental animals, such as flies and mice. And now the aging research community is shifting towards clinical translation of some of these discoveries. First, we'll revisit cellular senescence, which we talked a little bit about earlier. Researchers have now identified drugs that are able to clear these senescent cells from tissue. These drugs are termed senolytics. Early studies in mo mouse models have found positive effects in a wide variety of diseases after clearing senescent cells with these drugs. And senolytics have now been used in several very small open label clinical trials. Um, in mouse models, they've been shown to improve age-related bone loss, obesity-induced cognitive dysfunction, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, frailty, and interstitial lung disease. Here I'm showing you some fat tissue, which was um, taken from a patient treated with senolytic drugs and is being looked at under a microscope. Um, 
the senescent cells have been stained and turned blue. So you can see with this arrow that that's a senescent cell. And this graph is showing that after 14 days after um, senolytic treatment, that the number of senescent cells in the adipose tissue had decreased. So with this preliminary data that senolytics work to clear senescent cells from human tissue, researchers are aiming to start several other clinical trials. A lot of the work on senolytic drugs is actually being done here at Mayo Clinic, and I imagine you'll be hearing more about this in the years to come. Another ongoing project in the aging research field is a large study of the diabetes drug metformin as an anti-aging therapy. The TAME trial, or Targeting Aging with, with Metformin trial, will be a series of nationwide six-year clinical trials at 14 different institutions across the country that are planning to engage over 3,000 individuals between the ages of 65 and 79. These trials will test whether those taking metformin experience delayed development or progression of age-related chronic diseases like heart disease, cancer, and dementia. Metformin has been used to treat diabetes as a first-line therapy for over 60 years. It's safe and low cost, making it widely available. Therefore, this study could have a huge impact if there are positive results, as metformin is already um, widely available and well-known. Another category of drugs that is being studied to target aging mechanisms are so-called NAD boosters. Nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or NAD, is a molecule that is involved in many cellular functions and is a key player in metabolism. The levels of NAD reduce by half as we age. And in experimental animal models, activating NAD pathways or replacing NAD can extend lifespan and improve some diseases such as diabetes. Therefore, scientists are studying these drugs further to see whether they could delay or treat aging disease in humans. I'd like to give a disclaimer here that much more study is needed before these novel therapies will be safe or effective for use in humans. Therefore, it's not recommended that anyone take any of these drugs for a presumed anti-aging effect until the proper studies have been done to ensure their safety and effectiveness. So in summary, aging is universal, intrinsic, progressive, and heterogeneous. Fundamental aging processes have been identified and can be targeted with anti-aging therapies. And therapeutics to target these aging mechanisms are in development at various stages. And exercise, healthy diet, good sleep, and social connection are important. And those are all we've got until we've got these new therapies that I told you about. So if you're interested in learning more about aging research, I would really encourage you to visit the website of this organization. It's called the American Federation of Aging Research, or AFAR. Their website contains lots of educational materials, interviews with scientists on the cutting edge of aging, um, more information about aging processes and other resources. So thank you for your attention today. I hope you enjoyed the discussion about aging biology and current aging research. Um, please feel free to reach out to me at my email address, which is listed here palmer.allison, A-L-L-Y-S-O-N, at mayo.edu. Um, I'd be happy to give you more information on anything that I discussed or answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much.